time now for Back Pages tonight here on Sky Sports News, bringing you a first look at the sports stories in the morning's newspapers. And joining us tonight, The Guardian sports writer Jonathan Yu and the Independence Chief Football Writer Miguel Delaney. Very good evening to you both. Gents, we'll hear from you shortly. Let's run you through the Back Pages as we have them so far this Thursday evening. So the Times leads with news of Phil Foden heading back to the England camp after his brief exit to attend the birth of his third child. They also cover that crushing defeat for Joss Butler's men in the semi-finals of the T20 World Cup at the hands of India. Plus, Andy Murray's late call on whether or not to play at Wimbledon. And indeed, whether he'll play doubles or singles. Um, the Daily Mail has decided enough is enough with the gloom around England at the Euros. To prove it, they've launched a Back the Lads campaign. Uh, will it prove inspirational uh, for England against Slovakia on Sunday? Uh, also, Sam Wallace's piece in The Telegraph says it's time for the players to take control. Citing the example of Italia 90, where a meeting of the senior pros and Sir Bobby Robson inspired a change of tactics and ultimately a change of fortune too. To The Sun, uh, which covers it from Jude Bellingham's angle, he says fatigue and nearly did for him against Slovenia. Uh, but the fans got him through. They also covered the cricket. There's a more on Murray's battle for fitness ahead of Wimbledon. OK, so let's start off with England. Lots to go out. Um, Miguel, if we could start off with you and the return of Phil Foden to the England camp. A minor interruption still, you know, uh, involved in with a couple of days to go ahead of the Slovakia game. Um, I mean, do you think it was much of a distraction? You know, we've seen this before, haven't we, with England, with players leaving the camp, but this one felt that it was for a, a happy reason and really ultimately probably hasn't done too much in terms of disruption for England and co. Yeah, as you say, a happy reason. Also, I mean, it's just basic good man, man management. Let a player go in that way. Similarly, it's just Germany. It's a short flight, not like it would have been even in Qatar. So no real effect in that sense. Uh, and we might well see, a, a, well, Foden, to be fair, I, I thought he was one of England's better players against Slovenia. But we might even see him kind of further revitalise after this. Um, amid, I suppose, growing debate over his position. But he certainly looks like he's coming into form and now he'll be in... in even better mood. I mean, Jonathan, when, when we think about, you know, the, the, the positions that are being, I suppose, um, discussed right now, um, Jude Bellingham I'm talking about fatigue uh, in, in the lion's den on England's sort of in-house content. Um, is, is there any doubt in your mind about how England will, will line up? I mean, Maynou seems to be the, the word right now alongside Declan Rice. Jude Bellingham, despite the fact that he is tired and feeling the, the effects of a, a long season with Real Madrid, you would imagine he will still start at 10, phones still left and Saka still right, or any change to that from your side of things? Yeah, I actually think this is more up in the air than you, you might have expected at this stage uh, from Southgate, who, who's the kind of coach who likes to have a plan, who likes to have a formula and, and to stick with it through the tournament. I mean, the, there are so many positions and and roles that are, that are up in the air at the moment. I think it's it, that, that's just the nature of, of how they've played and, and the various problems and, and flaws that are in this side. So, you know, there, there has been talk that Maynou will come into the midfield. That, that, that'll that probably be for Conor Gallagher. But then, you know, you, you hear that Kieran Trippier might be, you know, carrying some sort of knock on, on uh, left back. And, and there's been a bit of talk about maybe Kyle Walker comes in on, on, on that side and, and you, you move Trent Alexander-Arnold to right back. There are so many different moving pieces in this England team. You know, Foden, does he come into the centre? Do you bring it? Do you bring in Anthony Gordon? Uh, you know, d does Bakaya Saka get a rest? Does, does Jude Bellingham get a rest? I mean, th there, there are... This is not the kind of situation you want to be in uh, going into the knockout stage of a major tournament. You're supposed to have a settled team. You're supposed to have, you know, some idea of, of, of who's going to be playing in your next game. But the, the fact that England have played so badly means that these positions are up for negotiation. And and there are actually very few players in that team who, are, who I think you, you would say they're absolutely guaranteed of their their place against, um, against Slovakia. Thing is that, you know, England could have done, you know, a little bit more in terms of that final group game and switching something up. They, they chose not to really. It was, you know, Gallagher alongside Rice, then hooked at half-time and Maynard comes in and, and plays well in that position. Do you think that, Miguel, that really, at some point, gives Maynu the lead in terms of selection for that position alongside Declan Rice? Or do you think that Southgate might just go for something very different, three centre-backs and wing-backs? Or what, what, what's your read? 
Well, first of all, I mean, just in, as a reflection, I suppose, your bigger question at the end there, I think, and, and this touches on what Johnny said as well, it is quite striking that in, in a tournament that England got into when clearly there are issues all over the pitch, where you actually bar defence, which had been the big concern going in, midfield clearly hasn't worked properly, the attack hasn't worked properly, and yet, and with all of that, of course, linked, and yet Southgate's only solution or response so far has been to change one position. Now, clearly England have bigger issues in that one position. That said, if he does stick with that, um, stick with this formation, uh, I, I think Mainu is the obvious choice for this game, not just because of what he did when he came on against Slovenia, which coincided with uh, England's, I think, most extended spell of control and possession that we've seen this tournament, arguably actually the only extended spell of control and possession we've seen this tournament, but also because it's probably going to be a very similar sort of game to that with Slovakia, I'd say, sitting sitting deep and looking to frustrate England in the exact same way Slovenia did. And in, in that sort of game, when they have more of the ball, Mainu's qualities are more, are, are more important than anything, actually, um, because they need someone to put their foot in it, to kind of to control the tempo, to get things moving. But one of the things, I suppose, that's maybe more interesting within all that is that, I mean, there's only been reference to Sam Wallace's piece about Italian 90, and, you know, whether they kind of change up mid-tournament. I mean, generally it is, I think, it's not, it, it doesn't speak as a, to a good thing if a manager doesn't know his team coming in or he has to play a first eleven for the first time he's ever done in a major tournament. But equally, there are examples of previous champions or teams that have done well in tournaments that actually find a team going through it. And maybe that was one potential effect of the second half against Slovakia when he brought in, brought on Palmer, brought on... Um, brought on yeah, Gordon, and it did have an effect. And maybe we will see kind of Southgate figure out his team in that way. And I think it's why this first 11, now I have to say, I've said this about every game so far, but why this first 11 for the Slovakia game could be instructive as to what's to come, if the course there is to be more after Sunday. Uh, just, just to stick with you, Miguel, um, I, I do wonder when you mention that that sort of reference, I suppose, you know, England fans will always look back to the tournaments where they did well and why things you know, changed for the better. And you look at Italian 90 and, you know, that meeting between the players and Sir Bobby Robson, which I referenced right at the top of the show. And we think about, you know, those um, senior players in the group. So that the leadership group, Harry Kane, Carl Walker, Declan Rice and Jude Bellingham, despite his, his very sort of, you know, young age. Do you think that they, those are the characters that can tell Gareth Southgate, look, we do need to play this way? and maybe that this player may be more suitable. Do you think that the, the voice is strong there? I think it's one of many reasons why this is a really interesting piece from Sam. Um, I mean, first of all, I, I, I mean, you, you touched on it yourself there, David. That, that team in Italian 90, you know, maybe it's our, our own age speaking in that regard, but you still got the sense that that was a team full of really experienced senior pros. And there has been a general shift in, in international football and club football in that way, and that there's a shift towards younger players for all sorts of reasons. But even still, that team was filled with senior pros who, I suppose, in that classic way that used to happen with coaches and managers around that period in the 90s where they could trust players to kind of make decisions on pitch themselves. We took a contrast now in a, in a highly systemized game. Uh, but equally, it, it, it again reflects uh, one of the more interesting discussions in this, this tournament that Cesc Fabregas actually picked up on. Now, I don't mean to, to uh, pick on Foden here because I think he's been one of England's better players. But I think this is more of a general comment that, that Fabregas made about Foden that's, like, that could be applied to the rest of the team, where he spoke about stepping up and taking responsibility. And maybe that's something that, you know, touching on this wider debate about the team and formation, maybe that's something that has to happen now, especially as we, England do have a lot of players at the kind of borderline age in their career in terms of kind of being considered still an element of kind of promising talent, not yet fully fulfilled to kind of really senior players in their prime. And, and maybe that's something we have to see on Sunday. And again, there's, there's so many echoes here, given um, it's, it's such a kind of callback to Euro 2016 as well. So England drew nil all with Slovakia in that tournament before a last 16 game that was seen as, um, as very winnable with a lot of kind of tension and issues swirling around the team. So there are echoes, but England, it's a bit of a fork in the road moment. Um, just an, another one briefly to, to Miguel uh, about the relationship between England and the fans. For me, it's always been something that's particularly in focus. It's scrutinised this vibe. What, what is it between England and the fans? And Jude Bellingham referenced it and he was talking about 
uh, that he could feel the negativity of the fans that weren't in Germany, but the ones that were watching from home. On the, in the mail, have decided to sort of take this on themselves. Um, this, this is the, this is the son uh, with with Jude Bellingham talking about the the, the um, you know the fans kept me going. I was absolutely dead. But I think you know the, the mail themselves have taken this on as a paper to say you know we can still win the Euros. How much do you think of that? Is 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 a factor with England? You know this relationship, the the culture, the the vibe of the whole thing. Oh, I think it's absolutely huge. Funny enough, I'm writing on exactly this for tomorrow. Um, and the whole kind of dynamic around it. I mean, as regards Bellingham, it's, I mean, it, he's very canny in that sense that he knows exactly what to, say, what to say. And I think even kind of striking maybe a bit of a difference between the fans who go and kind of those watching from TV is interesting in itself. Uh, and of course, Manny would point to the fact that many of those fans in the stadium threw cups at Southgate the other day. But there, there's a, a really interesting dynamic there, I suppose, that, that has kind of, it reflects some of the wider discussion around England this campaign, especially all the stuff about you know former players, podcasts, all the noise around the team, and even going back to Euro 2016. Given that one of Southgate's big missions and coming into England was to get rid of that weight, and he specific, like he really saw the nadir of it, the full weight of it in those games against Iceland and Slovakia in 2016, and now in what could be his final campaign, there's an element of a coming full circle that he has to arrest. And it, when Southgate has talked about this, I think it's been it's been quite um, pointed as well how he puts this new pressure on the team. He puts it down to himself. He thinks it's a, it's not about the players or their performances. He thinks it's about kind of the debate that he has caused. And he made a point of mentioning it to us the other night um, and how he, he's almost become a lightning rod for this. But it's also why he feels the need to um, maybe not protect the players from it, but to kind of guide them through it, to talk to, talk to them about how to deal with it. But it is interesting from that perspective because Southgate has mentioned the environment around this a lot. Then you've also got the situation where Declan Rice is talking about, um, you know, punditry. Um, Jared Bowen has mentioned it. And I do wonder, does talking about it so so players are forewarned, does it inoculate them, them from kind of the effect of all this criticism? Or does it actually mean this sort of, this sort of noise infects the camp uh, that can go two ways and again i think it points to why sunday's game is another sort of uh, fork in the road match all right miguel we're going to leave it there for the moment um we're going to take a quick break when we come back we're going to be looking at more of the back pages the guardian has stories on england's t20 world cup exit and the issues surrounding andy murray more on those next Welcome back. You're watching Back Pages tonight. Welcome back to the Garden Sports writer, Jonathan New and Miguel Delaney, chief football writer at The Independent. Um, Jonathan, before the break, we were talking with Miguel about just the general feeling, the culture around England right now, the relationship with the fans. Uh, if we look at the back of the mirror, um, a, a lot of kind of quite powerful words. Lout of order, anger at Cologne, booze, booze. Fans who threw beer at Southgate soaked our families, says uh, Esri Konser. I mean, you know, how much do you think this is a factor uh, in terms of this relationship between fans and England, both there at the tournament in Germany and indeed just watching at home? I think there's definitely a disconnect. I mean, it, it is possible, I think, to sort of overemphasize the the miscreants, the you know, the the, the fans that, that that overstep the line. Whether it's maybe, I mean, how many people were, were throwing cups at Gareth Southgate? Two, three out of you know tens of thousands in the stadium. Uh, I, I think that there is a there is a sense in which fixating on those those people masks the wider disconnect. I think between this England team and the fan base, which I think is something that has been growing over months and years it's not it's not necessarily down to the result of this tournament although clearly that has been a kind of a kind of trigger point for a lot of the, the criticism of them there does seem to be a big disconnect between the fans and you know i think getting to the euros final and 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 you know the strong results in the, the first part of gareth southgate's reign papered over that a little bit but there does seem to be i mean i'm talking to a lot of england fans out here in germany it's not, you know, they don't hate Southgate. They, you know, they don't. It's nothing personal. They don't hate the players even. I, I think there's just a kind of disappointment there that there is there is a golden opportunity here that is being squandered. You know, these tournaments don't come around so often. These this these generations of players don't come around so often, and 
the, the number of chances that England are going are to have with these players to win a tournament, and, and especially if you look at the way the draws open now, are going to be are, are so few. Uh, and fans have, in the most part, paid tens of thousands of pounds. They've taken time off work. You know, they've they've made personal sacrifices to be here, and then they've been sort of treated, uh, you know, by by the, the German train system. You know, all, all the experiences that, that they've gone they've gone through with that. And you know, I think they just want to see something that that moves them a little bit. They want to see a team that that really kind of goes for it. And that's, I think, the main criticism of them that there hasn't been that kind of that that I, I desire is the wrong word because obviously they want to win and and it's possible they don't want to win too much. But the drive, the dynamism, uh, the pace, the the, the 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 want to to kind of connect with the, those fans that that are are actually devoting so much of their of their time and energy to support England out, out in Germany here. Well, do you know what? If they want to support a team that goes for it, then they could do worse than supporting Georgia. Uh, because, you know, Mikatazzi, top, top scorer at this, at this tournament. They've managed to go through third in their group. We can touch on the format in, in a bit. Um, and in your paper, um, Miguel, the secret behind Georgia's thrilling Euro 2024 ride and why Spain must be where. Now, on paper, this is a mismatch, right? Georgia against Spain. But but talk to us about about Georgia and you know how they have thrilled and how they could be a threat. Yeah, I was at the game last night in Gelsenkirchen and it was I have to say the best event I've been to at this tournament so far. Uh, it was I mean a national event for Georgia that was a usually exciting football game and kind of fed into how really if Spain are the team of the tournament, Georgia are very much the story of the tournament. I mean, there's so much. This is their first their first ever qualification. It's a country of just 4 million people. They're kind of powered by this, um, you know, national emotion that you can, you can see and sense in the stadium. The noise for so many moments, and particularly the final whistle, was incredible. Um, and, and then, of course, the way they've gone through the tournament and even the way they play as well, which I think a lot of people have been struck by, uh, which is this kind of, a, it is a bit of a throwback, especially, I mean, it's very visible in how you see half their starting lineup, including the star, Kvartskelia, with their socks rolled down, like out of the 80s. And a lot of them play that kind of that languid style of the 80s. They're able to change feet so quickly, uh, take people on. And I, I was speaking to Willie Sanyol, um, the Georgia manager, uh, about this in his press conference afterwards, where he said that actually comes from 15 years ago when the Georgia Federation had the foresight to obviously change their infrastructure. And that's something we've heard so often about so many countries. And it, there's always, it always feels like there's one uh, smaller resourced country at every tournament that kind of offers this example. But that doesn't mean these things are general because one of the things that Georgia did, was very, which was so distinctive, was to, yes, take the kind of modern academy system, but make sure that they took kind of the expressiveness and the specific style of play from their own football culture and ensure that players grew up with that. And I think we, we can see it in so many exciting games, and particularly the nature of that first goal against Portugal, which was incredible. But it was, it was touching as well. I mean, for all we're talking about kind of the noise around England, the very different noise against Georgia was, you know, really kind of reaffirming. And, he, and, and Kvarch, sorry, Kvarch Gellia, uh was going on about, you know, how this is the best day of his life and a dream. Simple words, but so much emotion behind them. Yeah, and, and you can't not engage and, and find that compelling and alluring and really connect with it. Um, I'm just to get the back page of the eye, Jonathan. Um, and talking about, you know, teams that have got this expectation but not... Not really delivering on that. Of course, we've talked about England. Um, Belgium are another one with this so-called golden generation that they've had. From tin tin to tin pot, or tan tan, I suppose they'd say over there, to tin pot. How Belgium are falling apart. And, and France as well, given you know what, what's happened with them and Didier Deschamps saying, if you don't like it, change the channel. It's not just England who are, who are struggling to really you know, put it all together when it really matters right now. This has actually been one of the themes of the tournament. Apart from Spain, I would say, uh, we haven't seen too many teams that, that haven't had a floor at, at some point. Uh, Germany obviously struggled against uh, Switzerland the other night. You know, Italy have struggled. France have struggled. Um, and and I, th I think that that's that's what makes this tournament so open. Belgium, you know, we we, ob we obviously know, you know, it's, it's become a bit of a cliche to talk about their golden generation. It's actually a, a very different team to, to the, the team that rocked up in France for Euro 2016, you know. That that initial wave of Belgian talent has, has, you know, for the most part, been replaced. You know, you've got guys like Doku now and and, and Luda Bacchio. Uh, but the expectation that that first generation set is still there, and so a team in transition, essentially, uh, with a few aging stars and a few a few new players, and and you know, essentially a, a young manager at Tedesco trying to blend it all together. 
they are being held up to the standards of their predecessors. And I think that that's one of the reasons that I think they've struggled that they they absolutely you know they breeze through qualifying but it's it's um it's in tournaments that they have, have found their achilles heel and and you know they, they flattered to deceive in qatar and i think you know unless they step it up a level against france they, they might flatter to deceive again here um miguel just a really quick one to you on on the format uh, obviously 24 teams which means that the best four third places go through are you a fan are you not a fan it's as a result of that the georgia have gone through but you know overall do you think it devalues the tournament I mean, it's the World Cup format that I grew up with, so you'd think of them to be some affinity there. Ireland got through uh, that system in, in 1990 and 94. Um, but uh, it obviously has positives in kind of stories like Georgia, which are possible because of that. But on the whole, I think, especially compared to what the Euros was, which for me, between 96 and 2012, before the change, I think it was pretty much a perfect tournament. I think 16 teams was a perfect number. It was a concentration of quality, ensuring there was real competitiveness, competitiveness in all groups, but also it was just wide enough, I think, to allow some of these stories. I mean, Latvia qualified for 2004. Greece, of course, won it in 2004. Um, so on the whole, I think it's just, it, it, it takes something away from the tournament. And I, I don't like the kind of asymmetry of the, um, I mean, even, even the fact yesterday that, you know, teams that have, and I think it's striking how the, the first two teams that finished third, Hungary and Croatia, they were forced to wait around and they're the two that go out. So even that situation, I think it, it almost becomes anti-sporting in that way. I and mean, I think we saw the effects in Belgium's group with the way those games kind of played out for draws despite Ukraine ultimately suffering and really trying to go for it. But um, it, it couldn't happen. Yeah, I, I don't think it works well from that perspective, okay. even though there are some positives. I'm going I'm to have to jump in because we really want to talk about the cricket with Jonathan. Um, I mean, you know, England bombing out, 68-run defeat to, to India. How, how disappointing was this having battled to get through to the semis? Briefly, briefly, if you can, Jonathan. Yeah, I mean, it, it, India spun them out. It was it was a turning wicket. I mean, I thought Butler's not a not a good captain. Like terrible, like baffling decision not to bowl Moen Ali. And it just feels like the end of an era for this team. You look you look at the age profile of that side. They're all in their thirties, late twenties. I don't see the leaders coming through in that in that team. And you know, it's been it's been a great ride, but I think that that team needs some major surgery. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, we're going to leave it there. Jonathan, Miguel, thank you very much indeed. Really appreciate your company this evening.